Welcome back to another tutorial video on PixInsight. It's been a while since I've last recorded one, and this has been prompted by a number of questions and queries and problems on various forums. And we're going to look again at processing CMOS camera images, and in particular, how to calibrate them successfully. Now, not all CMOS cameras are the same. You're dealing with some that are color cameras and also some that are monochrome, as I'm using here. And in particular, the way that CMOS sensors work differ from the way that we've used CCD cameras and sensors in the past. And some of those differences are quite subtle and can catch you out during the image calibration part of the processing sequence. And it will cause either an injection of noise into your images or strange glows and artifacts in various parts of the perimeter. So this screen at the moment is showing Sequence Generator Pro and a sequence of images I was taking last night. And without stretching, it just looks pretty empty black with a few white dots. If I stretch it, you'll immediately see that I have amp glow coming out the side here. This is not a bright star um, and I've got a bit of a galaxy down there and I'm doing a mosaic and if I look at some of the other panels of the mosaic you will see just put up one other one and if I stretch this one you can see on this dimmer image it's, it, it shows up even worse and if you don't calibrate these images very carefully a vestige of this will remain it's important to realize that even if I can calibrate out this starburst coming from the side of the image, it'll still leave a telltale imprint on the image, on the calibrated image, because along with light comes shot noise. And so there will be slightly greater noise around this area here. Let's take a look at how we do the calibrations. So I'm going to bring up a Pixen site and I've done a bit of preparatory work to show you what I do and the best way of doing it in terms of keeping things nice and simple and consistent. So this is a PixInsight project. The project is empty apart from three tabs and each tab has a number of process icons that I've minimized and stored down the side here. If you're not aware of that, if I just take any process icon like crop and then if I was to drag that to the desktop, it creates an icon and then I can give it a name. So that's now stored with its values and I can repeat that by either dragging that onto an image or double clicking it and dragging that onto an image. So that's something that's quite useful and it's a way of creating something that you can recall without having to remember all the settings each time. And what I've done is all the processes that I run on my calibration and light frames in the sequence that I run them. And I have three tabs. Originally, I had one tab for CCD cameras. And then I created another tab for color CMOS cameras. And then very slightly different, another tab for ordinary monochrome CMOS cameras which is what I'm using in this particular instance. The only difference really between the color and the monochrome is that in the early parts of the calibration process, you're dealing with a color filter array image. And it's only after you've actually done all of the, um, the image calibration do you debayer it. If I just go onto that tab, you'll see it. So after creating your master darks and your flat frames, and you've then calibrated your light frames, uh, done cosmetic correction if you're going to do that, then you debayer it, and that creates a color image, which is then registered and stacked. On a standard monochrome sensor, you don't have the debayer, and you can register your already calibrated image frames straight away without having to do anything fancy. So let's take a look at the process. So to start with, you'll notice that this title up here says Master Dark, Dark Flat, and that gives away what I'm doing here. There's no longer any master bias 
One of the things I've discovered with CMOS sensors is that master biases have very little value and I don't do them anymore. And for the same reason, super bias isn't really needed. So what I'm going to do there is simply remove it because it really isn't necessary. In terms of the input images, you would put all your files in that you're going to put in. So this would be your dark frames and you would integrate them. And when you integrate them, you will not normalize them, but you will do some rejection. So you're rejecting things like cosmic ray hits, which still can occur and really sort of very strange random events that you wouldn't normally expect because otherwise that will distort what you're trying to achieve with a master dark file. I'm going to clip pixels that are outside certain regions and I'm also going to cut off black pixels in effect, ones that are very very low in value. And you'd run that on all your dark frames and create a set of master darks. And you need a master dark with the self same settings as your light frames. So that is the same gain, the same offset and the same temperature and exposure duration. So if you don't have all those attributes matched, your dark frames will not be optimum. Once you've done your dark frames, you can now start calibrating your flat frames. So the flat frames, again, you do flat frames for each combination of filter gain, binning, and so forth. So exactly the same conditions as you took your image um, pictures, but obviously the flat frame exposure is optimized so that you get no clipping, either dark or light, and you get a, a good spread. And I'll show that in just a second. So the interesting thing here is when you calibrate your flat frames, you only use master dark. And you think, well, hang on a minute, that doesn't make any sense. The master dark you're going to use here, you, you would have expected, hey, hey, let's just wind back a second, you would expect master bias. Take your bias frames from your flat frames and, and you're all good. Well, this is one of the problems with CMOS sensors. If you have a dark frame and let's say it's five seconds long, if you measure the mean level, it can sometimes be less than the, the bias frame, which is contrary to what you would expect with a standard CCD sensor. So the trick here is to not use bias frames to calibrate anything, but simply use dark frames. And you're going to use dark frames of the same exposure duration and settings as your flat frame. So just before moving on, I'm just gonna come back to Sequence Generator Pro and show you what I mean by that. So I have another sequence up here, which is my flat sequence. And if I pick that up, you can see that it's comprised of two parts. There's some flats with a hydrogen alpha filter, gain of 10, um, exposure of two seconds, two by two binning, and I took 30 shots. And then I made myself a little reminder in the event settings to put the lens cap on, and I then took dark frames of the same gain and duration and binning, and I took 30 frames of that as well. And in PixInsight, when you calibrate your flat frames, you're using these dark frames that you captured here, not the, the dark frames that you use for your main exposure, which in this particular image was 600 seconds. So if I just come back out of that for a second and get rid of that and come back to PixInsight. So this will be my two second dark frame. And significantly, you do not do calibrate or optimize because we've already created masters. Once I've done that, and you've got a set of calibrated flat frames, you can then do the, the actual calibration, uh, sorry, the, the stacking of the flats. So what I would typically have is I'd have some pixel rejection, uh, which again is just taking out the real outliers. So four or three sigma high maybe. So that's something that has less like than the 1% percentage of likelihood of happening and cut out any black pixels, which they just mess things up. And once you've done that, you will have a master flat file. Moving on to light calibration. This is again where we start deviating from what you may have known when you used a CCD sensor. So again, you put your target frames in here, 
This is not a color camera, so that's disabled here. And again, get rid of that as well. Doesn't need to be there. And then you put your output files and your destination and so forth. You don't have to worry about overscan if you're using Sequence Generator Pro since it doesn't include it. You do not use master bias um, because the master bias is already in the master dark. Just to wind back again, when we created our master darks, you'll notice that we didn't do any bias subtraction. So the bias is already in the master dark, if it's there at all. And again, no calibration um, because we've got a master and no optimization because again, the way that CMOS sensors work, if you optimize and start scaling the darks before subtracting them, you will reintroduce the problems that you're trying to get rid of. And then we can include the master flat that we've just created beforehand. And that would create your set of calibrated light frames. And then if you chose to, you could do cosmetic correction as, we, as normal, and then image registration, and then you do to create your stacked image, you would typically do some form of weighted integration. And I've got two versions here. Um, this one is what I've been using traditionally. And this will be a, a Windsor Ride Sigma clipping rejection. Um, I'm using about three and a half Sigma to, to reject the outliers and things like cosmic ray hits. And I reject the very, very dark pixels and that's about it. The other possibility, which is increasing in its um, frequency of people using it, is a slightly more intelligent form of weighting. The weighting itself, I think, is defined in here. If you look at the weighting, it's got the noise evaluation. There is another option, which is stored in this one here, which is to use something called the FITS keyword. And the FITS keyword that the weighting algorithm produces is called SS weight. And SS stands for subframe selector. And if you use that, it'll look into the fits file of each image before stacking and use that as the weighting parameter. Now, this isn't a tutorial on using the subframe selector, but in essence, it's another process within PixInsight that allows you to combine a number of attributes to create an overall goodness factor called SS weight. And that can be star shape, star size, noise, number of stars in an image, and so forth. And you can create a little algorithm that says, well, that's more important than this, so I'll, I'll do this weighting, and off you go. Now, you might be asking, well, that's appeared in the most recent version of one of the scripts for batch preprocessing. And that is correct. And just before signing off, I want to show you that script and show you a potential pitfall which will cause you problems with CMOS sensor calibration. So if I close that for a second and bring up the script we we're referring to, it's under batch preprocessing and it's now the preferred one called weighted batch preprocessing. It looks fairly familiar to the one that's been kicking around for a few years, except there is a new little box in here called subframe weighting. And this is used just at the last part of the stacking process to define how much contribution each calibrated image makes to the final stack. Now traditionally people have said don't use the pre-processing script to generate an integrated image because you can do far better by filling around you know using the standard um, process tool and that probably is still correct but certainly this one does a better job um, potentially than the previous script, which didn't have the same degree of control. However, there is a slight problem here. You've got bias, darks, flats, and lights. And while it is entirely possible to stick in your flat frames and your dark frames and your dark frames that you used for, for, for flat darks, you need to be a little bit careful because it also has a bias frame tab. And the temptation is, is if you've taken bias frames, is to slap them in there. Well, what I've discovered with this particular script in its present form is as soon as you put bias frames in that tab, you can't prevent the script from using them, either to calibrate the flat files or the image files. So my advice is do not add any bias frames 
only darks, flats and lights. And in the cases of darks, when you add dark frames, you can, um, you can actually choose what type of dark it is. So you can choose either um, the, the dark, say the 600 second darks that I was using for, to calibrate the image, or my two second darks to calibrate the flat file. And the, the key parameter to make sure it chooses the right one is, is when you do your flats and you calibrate with flat darks, which is ticked here, which is an important parameter, you can also look at the, the ability for the, the script to decide which dark frame to use. And that is used on the dark tab. And there's an, something called exposure tolerance. So in other words, it has to be within one second of the same exposure. And I use one second because ultimately I'm exposing my frames for exactly the right exposure time. So I don't really need a tolerance there at all. Um, if you were arguably taking two, three or four second flat frames, you might stick one in the middle at three seconds or something and make that a couple of seconds. But I think it's worth going the extra mile and just making it all match perfectly and then you don't worry about it. But the key thing here is do not use bias frames whatsoever when using a CMOS camera. Now, there will be some people that say, but it does work. And the answer is it might work because some CMOS sensors do not do this kind of background pedestal dark frame subtraction on, on the chip itself and behave more like a traditional CCD. But if you don't use bias frames and you simply use flat darks, it'll work with all sensors equally well. And using bias frames won't necessarily give you a better result, even with those minority of sensors that don't do, in effect, internal dark frame subtraction. There you have it, a little tutorial that hopefully puts to bed some problems that people have recently had using CMOS cameras. Again, thank you for watching, and if you have any ideas of what I can do next, please let me know.